Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We have folks from all around the world joining us today, and we're super excited to uh, to host this session called Powering a Sustainable Future. You know, change is everywhere, and we've felt it more this year than maybe ever before. But the things that are happening to us today have even compounded on top of things that were already happening in the utility industry prior to this. And so today we wanted to take a time out. We wanted to sit down and have this industry event, and we wanted to discuss the many forces that were driving the change within the utility industry. We wanted to highlight some of the digital strategies and the technologies that are underlying those digital strategies that are helping us evolve with that. And we wanted to have an honest conversation about what's going on. Um, and, and we're gonna do that with you by this exclusive presentation brought to you by Nudesic and Microsoft that's gonna be structured in a, in a very simple way. We're gonna have two presentations that's gonna kind of walk us through um, industry trends. We're gonna talk through some of the challenges that we're facing, and we're gonna talk through some practical ways that we're applying technology to, to help solve some of the complex problems. The latter part of this event is gonna be a industry expert panel discussion. It's gonna be about 40 to 45 minutes in length, and it's gonna come with uh, three very visionary leaders, um, three women that we uh, work with both professionally and I believe we've built great personal relationships with, and they're gonna give us sort of the stories from the front lines. And so you're gonna hear from Con Edison, Pennsylvania Power and Light. So sit back, relax. Um, we got 75 minutes together. We're excited for the content that we're gonna present to you. I'm gonna hand this off to Scott Hardin. Scott is uh, the Chief Technology Officer over the Energy Vertical at Microsoft, and he's gonna go ahead and start us off today. Scott? Yeah, thanks, Mike, I appreciate that. So welcome, everybody. And I, I first wanna say thank you very much to our partners, New Desk, for inviting us into this conversation to be part of this event. You know, it's a great topic, and it's something that's you know very front of mind for us. Um, just a little bit about our the Microsoft Energy. We're a worldwide team that uh, focuses on really aligning our uh, customers, our partner ecosystem, <laughs> and our product engineering teams. And what we're really focused on is bringing domain relevance <clears throat> into industry. And Microsoft has prioritized energy as an industry because there are certainly a lot of forces in effect right now that we feel like we can really contribute and add a lot of value. <clears throat> So first, I just want to talk a little bit about cloud because ultimately public cloud is kind of where we are really adding a lot of contribution right now in this industry. Just a little bit of history about our cloud. So we've actually been investing in the, our, our public cloud for over 10 years. And the, for, for anybody who didn't know, the original name for actually Azure was uh, Project Red Dog. And that was an internal name. And, in two, and this was in 2010. It was really just an additive service that was to additive to Windows OS. And it was the concept of public cloud was really to just look at what could be done um, in a remote situation that could be done on a desktop or in your data center, in your machine, in your uh, offices. And so it's really about what could be on a VM, could be in the office, it could be in the cloud. So in March of 2014, our cloud was renamed to Microsoft Azure, and it evolved into something that uh, businesses really should do. VMs have become orchestrated into multi-tenant environments that offered infrastructure as a service, and customers were now able to take advantage of the economic benefits and the scale of, and security of cloud. And so when you really started talking about how you could actually access systems by way of cellular and ubiquitous Wi-Fi, lift and shift became a real common term and IT workloads started to move from the back office into the cloud. But where we are today, this is what really kind of adds a lot of impact on energy. And the way that Microsoft views cloud today is really about how it plays a strategic role in industry. Um, if you look at where we are, we're part of an exclusive class of what we consider hyperscale cloud providers. We have over 220 20 data centers around the world in 54 regions, and our cloud capabilities truly span from the cloud to the edge by way of a lot of the IoT capabilities. We have over 600 platform services now that are actually strategic enablers for a new class of applications that's truly elastic and scalable on demand. And so where we see how we apply this, we've kind of progressed into you know, problems that you could solve 
and from problems that you should solve into the realm of really enabling capabilities that are unprecedented, that are leveraging the unprecedented scale and performance of public cloud to take on what should be the must solve challenges associated with energy transition. And so I just wanted to establish that as a backdrop because it's really leveraging cloud as a resource is that where we see we can truly make impact uh, in industry. So just a little bit about you know, our viewpoint on this and why Microsoft is investing into energy. There's clearly a lot of disruption and change that's happening now. And really it started you know, several years ago, but you see companies around the globe that are really talking about ambitious sustainability goals now. And in and, and our energy industry team, we really focus on energy all up by deliberate, deliberately. We look at, so we cover both oil and gas and power and utilities because we see convergence in this industry as the energy transition takes bite. And we truly really believe that the energy transition is real and it's happening now. I think it's left, that train has left the station a long time ago. And so when you see some of the commitments that are being made by companies like BP to move into renewables, Shell and what they're doing with new energies, these are truly impactful you know, changes and in, in commitments that are really affecting industry. So what, you, what we also see is really the rise of the, the new energy consumer and that the consumer has gone well beyond the rate payer and has now really looking at energy as a service and what they can do with power to be able to actually change what they do from a business perspective. And so no, not only are companies making commitments as far as renewable energy, but they're also actually making commitments to actually benefit what would be considered you know, effects on climate change and where they actually purchase power. Now, what has been unprecedented this year, obviously, is what has happened with COVID. And it has you know, really pushed businesses and industry into really a new paradigm in the way that they operate. But what we have seen is that COVID has had a, an, an impact on the acceleration of many of the digital transformation initiatives that were already in flight. And so Sacha made a comment uh, you know, several months ago about how we have seen digital transformation initiatives that were really projected to take place over a four year period happen in two months. And so it has been a remarkable catalyst. What we're also seeing is a higher penetration of renewables across the entire system. And this is really impactful for power and utilities, obviously, because you have a system that was designed to operate in one way, and now it's being pushed beyond its design limits, whereas you actually have power flowing not in one direction, but in two. And you actually are starting to see the formation of an internet of energy. The other thing that we're really seeing a lot of is really just the push into electrification of industry. And this is represented by, you know, obviously electric vehicles, but also with buildings. And you see a lot of new capabilities that are being, you know, addressed as far as, you know, building to grid integration. And finally, you really see what this is impacting from an industry perspective as this industry changes into this bi-directional Internet of Energy. There are new operating models that are starting to emerge. And so all of this kind of coupled with what we see is just just dynamic shift in energy consumption and the energy fuel source and the energy mix is really the framework by which Microsoft is wanting to lean into energy transition because we truly believe that technology is going to be foundational to a lot of this activity as energy transition plays out. So this year, with our prioritization on energy, Microsoft introduced what we call our industry priorities for energy. And these are really four starting point conversations that we're engaging with industry to talk about, you know, what is the particular role that we can play and how are we going to focus on particular outcomes that are supported by all our products and services that are represented along the bottom. What are these really talk? What are we talking about with each one of these topics? Well, it's about outcomes. And so I'll just make offer a few remarks to each of these. If you look to the left, you know, when it, we would look at uh, future operations and workforce transformation, a lot of that was already in flight. Right. And this is where I talked about the catalyst of COVID and the impact that it has made. But there's a lot of capabilities around intelligent supply chains 
around you know simulation of assets from the with digital twins around ubiquitous control centers especially in the age of COVID, where you have folks that actually need to be able to have situational awareness as far as what's happening with industry from a, from by working from home and so a lot of this these capabilities we were already engaged with our customers but with COVID, we have really seen an acceleration in a lot of that transformation the the two to the right are really about energy transition and when we speak to transition to clean, this is energy all up. Whereas we're focusing on topics such as emission reduction, looking at how we can not only help, you know, with the, the oil and gas majors that are transitioning into a new type of industry where they're getting into renewables, but also how they can operate in a much more clean way. And so there's a lot of capabilities that we're leaning in on with that. The other is really around renewables and, and renewables, you know, their they're renewables take a form of bulk generation as well as renewables at the edge. And as a matter of fact, with the recent uh, FERC order 2222, there's going to be likely a proliferation of renewables that are going to start to emerge at the edge of the grid in the United States and that those can now be essentially aggregated and bid back into the market. Projections there might even you know, be as high as 360 gigawatts by 2025. Now, but what do we do there? How does Microsoft lean in? Well, it's really around renewable integration, right? How, how can we provide capabilities that would enable decision level support on the grid to be able to you know, support this internet of energy where it really gets beyond the normal operating paradigm of centralized control. And you end up having, instead of thousands of sources of generation, millions of sources of generation potentially. The far right one is really around, you know, where are we going from a consumer perspective? And we, we call this reimagining energy. But what it really involves is a lot of the topics around smart buildings and cities, the building to grid integration that I touched on earlier, smarter consumers that are looking at being able to have the connected home that has rooftop solar and storage at the edge and how they can leverage their electric vehicles to be more productive. When it comes to industry, and now our, our, our industry priorities that I just talked about can really be applied across the entire value chain. And so where we have progressed in the last six months since we came out with our industry priorities is how do we apply these across the value chain? And so the conversations that we're getting into now with our customers is really about what does transform your workforce mean across this value chain? And so on the generation side, what, off, what capabilities can we offer from a skills enhancement perspective? How do we improve processes in generation? Same notion applies on the distribution side of the equation, or even when you look at how you could enable uh, the smart buildings, smart homes, how do you apply transition to clean into what is happening with the commercial and industrial facilities? But ultimately, this has to end up manifesting by way of solutions that are brought to market. And this is where I want to point out a real important distinction between what Microsoft does and what our partners offer. Because Microsoft is not a first party solution provider with the exception of some of our key applications around M365 and Dynamics. Azure is a platform. And the way that Azure will be truly utilized by industry is going to be by way of partnerships with companies or partners such as Nudesic. And so this is kind of our thinking and how we actually collaborate with partners because Nudesic has solutions that they focus on around AMI analytics, around focusing on distributed energy resource management, around operational platforms that involve new capabilities, including you know, data and analytics. And so how do we engage? And so this is a very topical discussion for us to have with our partners like Nudesic. And we're talking about these solutions that they are bringing to market from a first party perspective. So where my team comes in is we really work very closely with Nudesic to help them understand those platform services that we have within Azure how they can be leveraged for customers, and then also how we can actually go to market together and actually provide net new capabilities to our customers. And so the relationships like this are really exciting for us and uh, really glad to be part of this conversation because you know, it's gonna be uh, this type of partnership and the solution sets that we're gonna offer that we truly believe will be impactful for energy transition all up. 
So I just wanted to provide a couple of examples of some work that uh, we've been doing recently. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is just an example, and, and, and I, I want to stick to theme here because what we're really talking about is energy transition and what is happening, you know, with renewables and, and how can we have an impact on industry that may be atypical when it comes to technology. Scottish and Southern Energy has a company called Airtricity, and they're, they're Ireland's uh, largest provider of 100% green energy to install and manage the internet connected solar panels, which are connected via Azure IoT to Azure. And this, this is a new model that's in lieu of a standard power purchase agreement. The software tools uh, that uh, analyze real-time data on energy generated by the uh, solar panels demonstrates a mechanism for Microsoft and other corporations to actually achieve sustainability goals and reduce the carbon footprint of the power grid. So for the, Distributed Power Purchase Agreement, uh, Scottish and Southern Electricity uh, uses Azure IT to aggregate the generation of all the solar panels installed across uh, 27 schools around the uh, provinces of Leinster, and Munster, and Connacht. And they run it and get through a machine learning model to determine the actual carbon emissions that the solar panels offset. So the schools use the electricity generated by the panels, which reduces their utility bills, Microsoft, uh, by way of our alliance with this, receives the renewable energy credits for the generated electricity, which we apply uh, to our carbon neutrality commitments. So the panels are expected really to produce, you know, enough generate energy to uh, annually power the equivalent of what, 70 homes in Ireland for a year and abate more than 2.1 million kilograms of carbon. And so that's almost four and a half million pounds of carbon dioxide emissions that were removed over the 15 years of the agreement. The other example that I'm gonna provide is really about the operation of the grid. And Adgar Energy had a substation that was running over its capacity by a couple of megawatts just a few days of year. And, and as you would know, grid operators are really all about balancing supply and demand. But in the age of renewables, with a lot of uh, intermittent resources, it's much more difficult to predict. And so their options were really to look at, their option was, well, how, how did they replace the substation? It was going to cost like $5 million to replace this. Instead of doing this, uh, AgriEnergy teamed up with us and to connect the demand side flexibility uh, to dispatch load or increase supply when forecasting an overload situation. So the, the DSO was provided with tooling to forecast uh, substation level load based on historical data. And we were leveraging smart meters and weather data in combination with that to be able to help with a more intelligent forecast. We applied uh, Azure machine learning to this to deliver what would be a projected forecast. And the optimization service was built in the Azure to select and dispatch the most beneficial load or distributed resource based on asset profile, uh, current and future states, price signals from the market, as well as other properties. In the end, the customer was given a price to make their assets available and a higher price if their flexibility was actually leveraged. This, the reporting back to the DSO was actually done using our Power BI tools for, from, from, a, from a dashboarding perspective, showing the assets, the load, the customer, and the price in the dispatch situations. The retail company had the end customer relationship and uh, contract, and the DSO made a bid into the retailer and overload situations. So the DSO was, had visibility into what the demand side flexibility was, and the retailer with its portfolio was actually represented. So the last slide that I'm going to talk about is really just about Microsoft and our sustainability commitments. Um, you know, we, we made these commitments well over a year ago, and they've actually been accelerated in the last few months. But I think most folks are aware of what we have committed to in regards to becoming carbon negative by 2030, removing historical emissions by 2050, um, as well as our climate uh, innovation fund. The, the, what, what I think is important to also note is our commitment to sustainability beyond Microsoft. And really, sustainability has become part of our DNA. And so my team's role is to one, not only focus on how we can add value to the energy industry, but also from an energy transition perspective, 
what can Microsoft do to essentially enable our customers, to enable industry, to also focus on their own sustainability goals? What products and services can we bring to market that would actually play a very supporting role in moving the industry forward through energy transition to address the aggressive goals and the, the climate challenge as it presents itself? So with that, I uh, want to say thank you very much to New Desic to allow me to uh, come here and join this conversation, and I will turn it over to David. Awesome. Well, thanks, Scott, and thanks, everyone, for being here. My name is David Bess. I lead solutions for New Desic's energy and utility vertical. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some of the data-driven solution accelerators um, that we have and how that helps our clients. So our you know, at the highest level, our goal is to help our clients be on the winning side of this disruption that's taking place. So let's talk a little bit more about what that disruption actually looks like and what that means. Um, <clears throat> there's obviously digital disruption that's been taking place for a number of years and has accelerated a lot more recently with COVID, but specific to the utility industry, there's um, additional disruption that's taking place in the grid. So the grid is changing dramatically. <clears throat> uh, the way th the grid was operated, built, maintained in the past um, um, is changing pretty significantly. So just some important figures or benchmarks here. Global electricity demand is going to increase um, by 57% by 2050. That's actually a huge increase and it's going to require a ton of work uh, to service all of that demand. Renewable energy is expected to represent 50% of power resources by 2035, and um, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about the implications of that, but um, as many of you know, there's there's a huge impact from that change. Uh, one of the impacts is microgrids is anticipated to be a $30 billion industry by 2027. That's only six years away. Um, so a lot of this change is actually happening now, and it's been happening for the last several years, and it's coming really fast. And then distributed energy resources um, are projected to be 20% of U.S. peak load uh, by 2030. Some analysts feel that number could actually be much higher. You know, um, some of these things, they're hard to project, but uh, we are really approaching a watershed moment for things like rooftop solar and electric vehicles. Um, you know, in years past, it was kind of um, something that was expensive and maybe um, people who were wealthier or better off would buy, but um, that's all changing. You know, accessibility to solar and the EVs is changing significantly. And the automakers themselves, all the major automakers um, have put out commitments to have at least half of their production be electrified vehicles within the next five to 10 years. Um, so the change is coming, it's coming fast, and it's going to have huge impacts. And then just to bring it back to, I mean, even more recent to like right now, what's going on right now today, um, Scott mentioned briefly FERC order 2222 with the headline, you know, a new day for distributed energy resources. This requires all regional operators in the US to make a plan for distributed energy resources to be resold on the wholesale market through aggregates. Um, so there's a ton of work that needs to be done there. And then 67% of all new capacity that's being installed right now is renewables based, which is a tremendous shift from even three, three or four years ago. So next, I just want to share a little bit about Nudesic. Everyone knows uh, who Microsoft is, but some of you may not know about Nudesic. Um, Nudesic has deep integrations with Microsoft, um, where we've been partnering with Microsoft for uh, a couple decades now. We are 14-time uh, winner recipient of Microsoft Partner of the Year, and several of those were for our work in the utility space. We also have solution accelerators, um, which I'm going to talk about next. So what do I mean by a solution accelerator? A lot of these projects that we're talking about and that are needed to address the disruption that's taking place in the industry, they're, they're challenging and they're complex. There's a lot of moving parts. It can be a lot to get get our heads around. There's a lot of challenges, pitfalls, and there's failures. 80% uh, of all machine learning models never make it to production, and one half of all data warehouse projects fail. I mean, these are real challenges. So um, when we say solution accelerators, what we mean is 
Uh, we've built over 51% of the code in-house. So we have repeatable code and IP. We've spent over 6,000 hours investing in our own innovation labs um, to create these accelerators. Uh, but it's not just a commercial off the shelf product. So the final you know, 49% plus is going to be, we wanna work with you to customize it and integrate it into your systems so that it makes sense for your business. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? When you make that build versus buy decision, well, if we build it ourselves, there's a lot of risk, um, pitfalls, challenges. If you get a commercial off the shelf system, it can still be highly complex. Um, it can still fail. Um, and there's also sometimes limitations in terms of flexibility. Um, so um, our view on solution accelerators is we give, we want to provide the best of both worlds. So guaranteed outcomes, accelerated deployments, um, but also customization and real ownership um, in, and integration into your business. So just to walk through quickly kind of some of the focus areas that Nudesic has in our solutions um, in the utility space, I'm going to start at, I guess it would be like 11 o'clock and go kind of counterclockwise through this, this graphic. So when we say utility program design and implementation accelerators, this is really about advisory services, right? Because if you build a house, what's the first thing you need to do? You need to have a design, right? An architecture, a plan. Um, planning is key to success. So this is about helping set up the program, looking at things holistically, people, process, technology, budget, timelines, um, all those things we can help with. We have experience helping clients through this process and succeeding, uh, moving around counterclockwise, IoT and big data platforms. So the new grid has sensors on everything, right? Um, uh, we talk about things like AMI, we talk about the distribution assets, synchrophasers, reclosers, circuits, everything is getting an IoT device, is being integrated with SCADA and PI. It's a, a huge avalanche of data and it <laughs> provides major challenges um, to manage that data in a way that um, uh, is different than how you know traditional smaller data assets were managed in the past. So we have solutions for that as well. A utility cloud foundation framework. So um, a lot of our clients we work with, we hear again and again, you know, it's been a struggle to get to the cloud. They're interested, they want to do it, they understand there's value, but there's also challenges, pitfalls. Um, so we have solutions that can help you get to the cloud safely and reliably in an um, accelerated way with all the enterprise grade, you know, security and networking that you need. <clears throat> Purpose-built line of business applications. So every client I've worked with has in the utility space has a robust ecosystem of their own custom kind of in-house built applications to augment their commercial off the shelf systems and provide additional integrations and functionalities to get the right information to the right people at the right time for that decision level support. Um, so what we've kind of done is we've, you know, we're constantly analyzing the industry. Um, we understand the common commercial off the shelf systems and we've built line of business apps that kind of fill in those gaps and help integrate disparate data sources and multiple different data points from different systems into a holistic view to support those business outcomes and that decision level support. Pre-built AI machine learning models. So um, again, you know, 80% of machine learning models never make it to production. So we've done a ton of work in-house with things like load forecasting, uh, anomaly detection, voltage analysis, um, and we have all of those assets that we provide to our clients. And then templated dashboards and reports. So um, apps is one way to get the right information to the right people at the right time for decision level support. But um, in a lot of scenarios, a dashboard or report is more appropriate. So we have a ton of um, IP in that space as well. I will show a couple of examples uh, as we keep rolling. So I want to focus a little bit on renewables. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is just to let you know we do have a maturity model we've developed for renewables for utilities and it kind of goes through the whole process of end to end of getting started versus integrating this with all of your existing business processes and systems to you know all the way to the far right doing some advanced simulations and AI assisted grid operation and digital twins and augmented reality uh, field service. Revenue protection so revenue protection one thing we found is also being disrupted by the new grid, right? So traditionally, if people had, you know, dumb meters at their house, and, and the traditional model is uh, people would drive to your house with a clipboard, read your meter, write it down on a piece of paper, 
and then submit that back in, right? And everything, and that's basically how you get your bill and how we monitor. And while they're out there, they can visually inspect is someone bypassing or tampering with the meter or um, doing something they really shouldn't do uh, with the power. But um, in the new world, right, there's smart meters. More and more people are adopting smart meters. I know it's not universal yet, but um, a majority of the industry has either adopted or is in the process of planning for the smart meter deployment. And with AMI, you know, people aren't going to the homes anymore. So we need to be able to ingest this IoT data and this voltage data and these um, different faults and alerts from across the whole distribution network and intelligently sift through that data to find when there's faults, tampering, theft, and different issues. We're also seeing, you know, things going on with cryptocurrency mining and grow houses, which are kind of a gray market activity. So strictly speaking, may not be illegal, but um, people are doing this in residential areas that are not zoned. And the grid wasn't built to support, you know, someone uh, rents an apartment and then um, they don't, they're on a residential plan, so they don't submit a deposit and then they have a $50,000 bill um, from cryptocurrency mining because they just set up servers. Uh, and, and then people skip out on that bill and there's no revenue protection because there's no deposit in place. So. Um, we have some solutions and some IP and some algorithms where we kind of crawl through all the data and help detect these anomalies and how they're impacting the grid, how they're impacting revenue protection. And then we've also focused quite a bit on asset health. Um, it's becoming more and more important as um, IoT devices, SCADA and PI gets put on everything. Uh, things like network connectivity models, um, predictive maintenance, um, even like inventory and supply management. Um, as the grid becomes more and more complex, it becomes more and more complex to deal with uh, asset health and asset management. So we have some predefined data models, industry data models, and along with single click deployment databases. So we have scripts and CI CD pipelines that set up the whole database end to end to support the solution. We have some pre-trained machine learning models um, that help kind of predict like a, a health score for various assets. Um, and then also as well as consequence of, of failure. So if there's a failure or an outage, what is the impact to the grid? We have some models around that. And then purpose-built dashboards and configuration. So again, this is where if you were to build this from scratch, it might take weeks or months, uh, possibly longer. And then our solution could be done, you know, more like days to weeks um, type of deployment. Um, so all of these disruptions that are taking place and all of these solutions that we've been developing, we kind of wanted to put them into a higher level business architecture um, to bring it all together and codify everything. So this has led to what we call New Grid version 1.0, which is basically our business architecture for the modern grid. So um, super high level, right? We have our, our, IO, our distribution assets as well as our bulk renewable generation um, and other generation. We have our control systems, ADMS, DERMS, industrial control systems, the head end MDMS system. And then on the far right, just all of your common enterprise systems like work management system, outage management system, asset management system, all of these things, they need to be integrated. Uh, they need to be able to talk to each other and we need to be able to extract and combine information from them to get the right information to the right people at the right time for to enable that decision level support and the business outcomes that we're driving for. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Mike Rossi to go through our industry experience briefings. Thank you everyone so much. Yeah, awesome. Hey, David, thank you, Scott. Thank you, look forward to having both of you um, join our panel discussion here in a few minutes. But before we do, I uh, wanna to introduce today um, New Desix IEB, Industry Experience Briefings, which is um, new, launched today with these eight uh, categories that um, we can uh, integrate uh in an immersive way with your teams to kind of understand the challenges that you're working through and kind of define a path forward um a roadmap if you will to to kind of getting some quick wins under your belt so if you see something that's exciting to you on the menu we will be supplying a, a follow-up a quick survey where you can actually select um, one or many um, if there's something outside of this that you're interested in we can look to build some custom uh, content for you, but the design of these are to be one hour uh, kind of executive style briefing overviews. Again, they're immersive. We can go expand into any one category and go into some depth. Um, they're 
purpose built to be actionable and and to have like real outcomes that you know potentially you could take back to your business or your peers and say look at you know what we've accomplished and they're complimentary uh, for joining us today on this call. So we we have these eight. Again, let us know uh, through through the survey if that's an area of interest to you, and we'll be happy to get those scheduled and set up for you. Um, without further ado, we'll 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 move forward with our panel discussion, and I'm gonna at this time introduce uh, Michael Brown, our vice president of business strategy and also development over our utility vertical. Michael, thank you, everybody. So I'm excited because today I get the easy part, which is I get to just ask questions and listen to really smart individuals share information with you. So hopefully we'll come away with some great insights. Um, our panelists um, cover quite a range of different areas of the industry and have a lot of years of experience. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Allison Glasser from Con Edison, Joyce LePage from Detroit Thomas Edison and Christy Shooker from PPL. Thank you, ladies, for attending today. Um, to kick off, if we would, can we give you just a quick background of your own utility, what your experiences are, um, kind of what you think makes your organization unique? Um, what are some of the changes that you've observed in the last uh, 12 months? Obviously, this has been a year of disruption, certainly. And then kind of where do you see things headed over you know, the mid-range, let's say, the next three to five years? And then um, where do you see the utility industry evolving you know, even beyond that? And then um, just... Kind of any of your general observations of what's top of mind and what what it is that you're spending your time and energy on today bad pun um to keep things moving so without without that uh i'm sorry with that in mind um let's kick this off by having allison would you mind presenting my name is allison glasser i am a director uh in it at con edison um and first i guess i'll go a little i'll go through a little bit about our companies uh, and then i'll get into some of my background um, but Con Edison is basically comprised of two regu regulated utilities. Um, Con Edison provides service to customers in New York City, which has a, a unique set of um, opportunities. Uh, we also um, su supply uh, all the boroughs in Westchester. We serve about 3.3 million electric customers and 1.1 million gas customers. And we also um, supply steam in certain parts of Manhattan. We also have uh, another regulated utility, Orange and Rockland, and they are basically um, Orange and Rockland counties in New York and parts of New Jersey, and they serve about 300 electric customers and 130 gas customers. Uh, another area of focus for us is our clean energy businesses, and they really focus on renewables. Um, They're the second largest solar provider in North America and the seventh largest in the world. And as a company, we, we are really just focused on that clean energy vision, um, you know, coupled with safety, diversity and inclusion, the customer experience and operational excellence. Um, for me, I've been with the company for about 22 years in different areas, everywhere from finance to operations. I worked in all various companies, including Orange and Rockland, as well as the CEBs. Um, the majority of my IT career was actually on the application side. And about six, six years ago, I moved over to infrastructure. And I've had different, I've held different, um, uh, different jobs on the infrastructure side. And right now I have um, ownership of enterprise architecture. Um, so I, uh, in the past I had um, just infrastructure architecture and we recently combined. And so now I have all of enterprise architecture as well as our digital factory, which is really focused on field force uh, mobility um, and, and you know, digital transformation. And we really look to looking to expand that capability across different uh, avenues within the company. I also have data and analytics, uh, as well as cloud and integration services. So quite quite, quite broad areas. Uh, this year, you know, I, I think like everybody, we've really been focusing on supporting the pandemic um, from, you know, trying to understand how we enable 60% of the workforce to be able to work from home, as well as what this new normal looks like. Um, from a technology perspective, uh, we've really been focusing on expanding capabilities like data and analytics. I think from a company, we're, we've really kind of just touched the surface, and we have some major initiatives going on in the areas of grid modernization, the customer experience to really kind of help improve those capabilities. I think in general, we're also trying to understand what digital transformation means to us. And again, we have small pockets, but do we take it you know, to a larger scale across, across the company? Um, and I think in general, all this, including digital transformation, will just really help to support that clean energy vision. Uh, another key area of focus, like everybody, um, and I don't know if every, you know, there's been some major um, breaches in the news today, uh, or this week, I should say. So security is always a big concern, and how do we kind of enable 
and move the needle and innovate while kind of ensuring that the security is, is uh, we're doing things in a secure manner. Um, and sometimes that can take longer than uh, what our customers want. So I just think, you know, our security is getting tighter and tighter, but we still need to innovate and iterate. So that's some of the, some of the, the challenges that we need to overcome as a company. So that's a little bit about myself and the company. And now I'll turn it over to Joyce. Uh, Joyce LePage from DTE Energy in Detroit. Uh, thanks everybody for being here today. A little bit about DTE Energy. We are located, headquartered in downtown Detroit. And uh, we operate both an electric utility and a natural gas utility, but are uh, really energy providers in uh, not only those spaces, but in a non-utility uh, sector as well. Uh, we have uh, operate uh, some interstate pipelines and have a number of uh, projects in uh, biomass, in uh, energy services, in large industrial projects, and uh, landfill and other non-regulated business. Our non-regulated size is um, quite quite dynamic and growing all the time. Uh, we have uh, more than 11,000 employees and 12.6 billion annual revenue. Uh, this year, or rather, let me back up just a tad about myself. Um, I've been with DTE for 20 years and I've got uh, 30 years of data of specific experience and where it's been applied in different ways in, in uh, um, DTE, I've had the pleasure in the last two and a half years or so to uh, start a enterprise level data and analytics organization within DTE, which we were long overdue for, but um, now have it in place and are, are growing and offering value uh, quite regularly. My perspective is going to be a little narrower and um, very data and analytic uh, centered. And our, our outlook is really to provide dependable access to whatever data is required by our business partners to do what they need to do every day and um, organize it, make sure it's of high quality and enable sophisticated analytics and data science to anyone across the um, enterprise. So strategically in our area, we're looking at uh, build and a short time to value for all our customers. That is going to feed into the enterprise strategies of customer uh, SAT um, and reliability, which are two definite hotspots for um, any utility. Uh, but the, there are definitely focus areas here at DTE. Inwardly, we work very hard at um, safety, paramount, uh, being dependable, respectful to each other, and uh, treating each other um, in a way that uh, we would want to be treated and to treat our customers. So we focus very, very heavily on our employees because that's who makes it all happen. Um, we're just recently the recipient of a Gallup Outstanding Place to Work for the eighth year in a row and um, are one of the few utilities in that space to do so. So we, we put a, a lot of onus on our uh, employees. Just like everyone else, biggest challenge this year has definitely been uh, managing COVID and reacting quickly and uh, keeping our our employees and our customers safe um, as we continue to supply a uh, very important part of society. Um, and that's the, what we call the lifeblood of our communities. And that's the energy we provide. Um, in terms of change, I think the need for data is going to only grow. We're putting more, the more technology that goes out there, the more data that is going to be produced. And so there will be a greater need for not only the capability to capture it and store it and process it, but then the skills needed to um, leverage it and get the value out of 
uh, undiscovered value out of, out of that data. So there is uh, quite a lot to uh, do, and um, it's rather an exciting time for us to be able to actually start to offer uh, this type of capability to our business partners. And I'll go ahead and hand it to Christy. All right, so hi everyone. Um, it's exciting to be on this panel and talking about digital transformation in the future of utilities. Um, my name is Christy Shooker. I'm the Director of IT Transformation at PPL Electric Utilities. Um, a little bit about my organization. We have the responsibility for new product build and delivery for our customers and our business. Um, and we're currently organized around a few key product portfolios, uh, such as our customer experience, our employee experience and uh, smart delivery, just to name a few of the things uh, that we have key focus on right now. Um, so uh, to move on a little bit about PPL Electric Utilities, uh, we have 1.4 million customers in 29 different counties across Pennsylvania with approximately 2,000 employees. So that equates to about 50,000 miles of power lines and a 10,000 square mile service territory. Um, I would say we're viewed as one of the nation's most trusted and innovative utilities. And, you know, some of the following highlights the reasons why. Uh, we're the winner of 28 JD Power Awards for customer satisfaction, and, and we've actually won for the ninth straight year in a row. And just to highlight a few others, you know, we, learned, we earned the SEPA Investor Owned Utility of the Year Award, and we also recently acquired three patents for smart grid, downed wire safety, and pull attachments. So uh, just to highlight some of the advances we've made as a utility, um, you know, we provide benefits to our customers and our employees in various ways. You know, a key area that we have is an improved customer experience in which we launched an improved website with new functionality and an improved IVR system. Um, and, and just like many others, we're in the midst of a workplace and digital evolution where we're really working towards transforming the way the frontline field employee works. In addition, in the last year and a half, we actually launched a new internal employee communications platform to keep our employees engaged and geared towards the work that matters most. Um, and on top of all of that, we benefit our customers with our grid automation and versatility, with improved safety, reliability, and resiliency. Um, we're focused on providing cutting edge smart grid technology and a DERMS platform for increasing adoption of renewables. And, and I would say like others, we're also focused on a, a data-driven asset management strategy to ensure we have a safe, uh, reliable, and resilient system. Um, so that's a little bit about myself and PPL. And, and I would say to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the changes and things that we've seen in the last 12 months. Um, you know, in addition to what everybody else said about COVID, I, I think I'll, I'll focus a little bit on our digital strategy. So, um, I would say in the last 12 months, what we used to spend our time on is, is really no longer what we're putting our focus on. Our, our legacy systems are now being supported by a managed service provider, which, is, which has allowed us as an IT organization to really shift our focus to some of the key strategic initiatives, um, some of which I already mentioned. And um, we're really, uh, are really about driving the business forward in some of these key areas, you know, such as our customer experience, which I mentioned. So I would say the last 12 months, um, you know, and if we look back 12 months ago, we were really just scratching the surface across PPL electric utilities on our transformation. And in the last 12 months, um, you know, all levels of the organization are, are really engaged in the new strategy and vision in, in one way or another. You know, whether, it, whether it's being part of our product teams that we formed or SMEs or really just reaping the benefits of the new tools and processes we're rolling out. Um, so I'd say for us, we've seen a lot of change in, in our digital strategy and transformation. And, and just to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the changes I see happening, you know, over the next couple of years, you know, I, I would say the shift, you know, that we're making now to continue to evolve as, as we gear ourselves towards um, our strategic initiatives and our product teams and, and the continuous improvement and iteration that brings, you know, with, with all of that shift, I think we're going to see the evolution of products and, that's going to allow us to better serve our customers in so many areas, you know, some of which I mentioned in the introduction of our company, but, you know, things like continuously improving our customer experience and our workplace evolution for our frontline field employees, you know, and our grid automation and versatility, I think is, is going to keep us evolving as a modern utility. Thank you ladies for giving us a little bit of a background and now let's kind of kick into the actual panel discussion itself. Um, obviously, you know, let's let's get it out of the way right up front. Let's talk about the magic of COVID. 
um, and what what the impact that's had on your industry, and, you know, and specifically your employees. So, Joyce, you mentioned you know one of the core values of DTE is that you know your employees are what really make it happen. Um, and a lot of the changes we've seen, and specifically in your industry, right? Most of you come from organizations that have been around um, decades. You know, some of you almost a century, um, or most most of you probably, you know, pushing on that century mark. Um, this is a dynamic shift, right? How do you suddenly take an organization that's been very rooted in being a brick and mortar facility um, where you're working with field crews coming in and out? Um, and how do you keep people safe in you know, a pandemic world? Um, so if we could talk a little bit about kind of the initiative you guys have taken and also how do you see this changing in the future as we talk about returning back to what will be the new world order of normal? You know, I know a lot of facilities are talking about downsizing. Um, what are you going to do with the actual space that you have? How are you redesigning? Um, you know, what applications and technologies are you going to leverage? So, Joyce, could you kick us off? Sure, happy to. Thanks. Um, so, uh, DTE um, was one of the first, if not the first, utility to send their um, workforce home, I believe. We did it uh, right mid March. And uh, at the same time, uh, suspended non-essential field work. So until we could put our fingers or wrap ourselves a little bit better around what the impact to our uh, workforce was going to be from a health and safety perspective, we really uh, did an aggressive pullback uh, to uh, keep people safe. Uh, with that, of course, uh, you can't send people home without technology to do their jobs because the company has to keep running. And uh, so um, implementation of work from home, particularly for customer service reps, uh, was of paramount importance. And um, there were several hurdles that we had to overcome there. Uh, and it, it was getting... <laughs> You know, people left thinking they were coming back Monday morning, but they did not. So some people had their equipment, others did not. So we had to find the right equipment, enough of the right equipment. Everybody wanted it, so we couldn't just go to our normal suppliers. So uh, we had our supply chain working hard to find what we needed. Um, we needed increased Internet bandwidth. We needed uh, remote access licenses. Uh, voice response unit licenses, all these things had to be done very, very quickly. And um, I have to say all our suppliers for those things were able to fulfill and, and we could get that done. And I think we became operational in a work from home setting uh, very quickly, more quickly than anyone would have guessed. Um, it didn't hurt that we had just Months before uh, gotten Microsoft Teams rolled out across the enterprise, so the the bones were in place there, and um, it was then it was baptism by fire, so to speak, that you you will learn how to use this, and this is the way it's going to go. Um, so setting up the infrastructure to be able to support everybody working uh, from home, of course, it took time and was. Um, uh, key in keeping the company running. The other side was that, well, what's the impact of of the energy business on on COVID? So our corporate energy forecasting group uh, fortunately had the data that they needed to be able to uh, assess the impact of all those big industrial and commercial steel mills, auto plants. Everybody was shutting down. What's the impact uh, to our um, requirement for generation and um, how do we need to adjust, how is it going to impact cash flow, so on and so forth. So um, I think within a month we had we had a, a new forecast that, that we could rely on to do some future planning. And that was because we had the proper AMI data uh, on the data lake um, for them to uh, leverage. I was on the, I happened to be on the emergency response team for IT and so was a little more involved in a, a lot of the smaller digital initiatives too that came out of it. We need to track who is on site. And we were popping out little applications every couple of days to 
track who's on site, do a health screening on the way in, um, opt in for a COVID update text every day, um, absence reporting, uh, janitorial audits, all these little things that, that popped out of um, uh, needing uh, out of COVID. And um, so it, it really took a turn. And all this was going on while normal business continued, which was, I mean, the energy kept flowing. So uh, that was all very good. Um, and then looking forward, we it definitely changes the way um, our our um, facilities will be handled. Uh, we were we were really stretched on our our floor space um, in Detroit, particularly, and had just launched two weeks prior um, a new open floor plan. So we could um, essentially house more people per floor, and so that was that was the first one. It was two weeks, and my team happened to be on that floor, and we just started to live it. And then we all went home, and that's not going to happen. So we have to completely rethink how we're going to let people come back to the office. Or how how often will they come back? Will they reserve space? Will they? Um, go to a different building, will they go to the same building? And then the, the other part is, do we need all this floor space? And now we don't. And so we are already looking at uh, relieving ourselves of a couple buildings um, in different areas to, to just as part of the acknowledgement, we don't need the floor space and we will never go back to what used to be normal. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and yes, you guys had really cool new carpet and everything else that nobody's going to actually appreciate now. So that's a little bit sad. But. Correct. Correct. <laughs> um, all right. So let's move on to another topic here, which is obviously um, not only has your business had to change, but part of that change is being driven by your customers changing as well. Right. Um, customers have got very different expectations now than they did, let's say, five years ago. Everything, um, everybody wants to have insight and visibility into the services that they pay for, um, want to know real time, you know, are they getting the value that they, they feel they should be getting? Um, and obviously for utilities, that's going to be first and foremost. Um, obviously, you guys haven't gotten the JD Power Award for the ninth year straight. Christy, you guys must be doing something right. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the changes that you've seen in your own customers and what PPL is doing to adapt to that and, and you know, not only um, meet that demand, but obviously create some sense of delight for your customers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would be happy to. I, I, we're, we're very proud at, at PPL um, regarding our customer experience. So I would say our, our average energy consumer um, is really looking for ways to save money and easily connect with us. And we saw so much opportunity to improve in that area and, and how we support our customers from a digital perspective. So we started a strategic program around our customer experience to improve our website functionality and our IVR system. Um, we, we had a series of journeys that we were working towards um, as part of this, this ongoing initiative, and we broke that down into two different product teams. So one product team focused on the website and the mobile first redesign, and the other product team focused on the IVR. So we started all the foundational work for this in the mid-January timeframe of this year, and we actually started moving changes to production just a few weeks later, uh, or sorry, a few months later. <laughs> the team wishes it was a few weeks. It took a few weeks to get moving on the foundational work items. Um, but really, with the full redesign, uh, we went live in the September timeframe. So on these journeys, we focused on things such as managing issues with paying your bills and, and start, stop, and move functionality. And and we tie that into our new IVR implementation and in, in which we successfully launched a new PPL alerting platform and, and a new natural language IVR. And, and that really you know, allows our customers to report things such as outages and, and get outage updates and, and get account information. And, and we include a predictive intent around things such as you know, a known outage or pending payments. Um, so the IVR has become much more user friendly and in some areas we're actually seeing a 100% success rate using our IVR for things like getting your account balance and reporting outages and getting outage updates. 
Um, so I would say that's really successful. And, and in regards to our website redesign, um, as I mentioned, you know, we have a mobile first mindset and, you know, we've implemented some newly revised journeys, uh, such as a streamlined payment process and, and dealing with issues paying bills, you know, as well as the whole registration process. And, and for that particular process, we're seeing a 65% reduction in time that our users are spending on the site pages per session. So, you know, for our customers, it really, you know, it gets them in and out quickly. And our auto pay enrollments are up by 38% since the redesign as well. Um, so in addition to all of this, you know, our, our average weekly payment agreements made on the web are up by 48%. And our share of web payment agreements has increased from 36% to 61%. You know, and, and we've already started to see a reduction in our incoming calls down by 15 percent. Um, you know, so some of the more technical details uh, behind this is we actually moved over 60 content pages to new components um, and we reduced the number of pages on our site from over 1200 to less than 500. You know, so I would say, you know, for us, you know, we're seeing that these changes in our customer journeys are are really providing some real value to our customers and how they interact with us. And I would say that's why, you know, we're, we're really proud of the work that we're, that we're doing in this area. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so another question that that kind of leads to is obviously you talk about, um, and both of you have mentioned this in your discussion so far, which is acceleration, right? Um, taking things that you have in front of you and instead of it being a three, five year plan, is it now becoming a 12 to 18 month plan um, or less in some instances, right? I think you mentioned, you know, starting in September um, and just a matter of weeks where, you know, historically I always, you know, make the joke that utilities kind of move at a glacial pace. Um, that's <laughs> no longer the world that you live in. Um, and so as you look at acceleration and different emerging technologies, um, you know, there's obviously a lot on your plates that you have to contend with. Um, how do you move things more quickly? Allison, can you talk a little bit about some of the changes in your own organization? and what you're doing at Con Ed in terms of being able to embrace, I know you guys are going through several major system upgrades all simultaneously, right? That um, I don't think is, is fairly unprecedented from anything I've known about the company's history. Um, just a little bit about what are you doing and what are the challenges that's presenting and how are you realigning your organization in order to meet that? Sure, uh, you know, as you stated, technology is moving so quickly and I think in general utilities and, and Con Ed, we tend to be more conservative, right? So, so from a Con Ed perspective, we are playing catch up meaning we're deploying, we're replacing our old mainframe billing system. We're deploying a new GIS system. We have tons of SCADA upgrades, things like that. And then when you add trying to enable the business with newer technologies, it just poses capacity constraints to a certain extent. Um, but again, you know, all these technologies are now a requirement. It's no longer a nice to have. So we're trying to meet those needs. Uh, and we've done a couple of things to kind of help move the needle. So I spoke earlier about creating that central architecture group. Um, the goal there is to really be able to give our customers a holistic approach to solutions. So right now, when we look at things, you know, they may be, let's take sensors, for example, they may be deploying the sensor out in the field, but they're not necessarily thinking about the five pieces of data that we need to put in the data lake for every sensor out there. So the enterprise architecture group is trying to get um, folks to look at things holistically, of course, document and develop the standards and, and reference architectures to help move the needle a little quicker, right? The concept is if they follow the standard, if the application or the deployment is following the standard, we can quickly iterate and move through the process versus having to reinvent the wheel, which is sometimes what, what we tend to do. So that's kind of kind of one area that I think will really help to, to improve the speed to market. In addition, we're kind of creating centers of excellence and governance, whether it's process automation and bots or analytics or even you know, our digital factory. So creating those centers of excellence so that the business can iterate and innovate on their own with our own guardrails, I think will also help. Again, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily a model for, for everything, but I think when you take um, data and analytics, if we have the tools in place and the foundational technology investments, and they have, they're able to, you know, perform algorithms on their own. I think that will help, um, you know, advance some of the capability quicker than just having a central group in IT performing the function. And quite frankly, the business understands their data better than IT does to a certain extent. Um, like some of the other folks on, on the panel, we also recently went through a major outsourcing initiative. So coupled with all these large big rock application deployments, 
we also decided to outsource um, basically our, our technology operations or commodity type services. And the main goal there was to enable us to be able to upskill and put people on more of the enabling technologies, again, to move that needle. So those are some of the key areas of focus for us to help kind of um, you know, improve how quickly we can respond to customer needs in this conservative world that is utilities. Excellent. So kind of the last question, I know all three of your organizations have significant cloud-based initiatives going on. Um, you've all talked about how you're leveraging data in different ways. You also have talked about the increase in your data um, and just the sheer amount of information that you're having to work through and how to work through it more quickly, um, which brings up the question that I think is probably first and foremost on the minds of all of people listening, which is how do you get around the old paradigm of CapEx versus OpEx, uh, right? Historically, the utility world has been slower to embrace um, the move to cloud simply because of the financial restrictions that are imposed um, on your accounting practices. Um, Allison, I think I'm going to throw it to you first and then I'll, I'll let Christy and Joyce chime in because I think this is one I'd like to hear from everybody. But um, I think you've had the benefit of saying you guys are, are you know, while a conservative organization, a bit more progressive in that regard. Can you talk to a little bit about it? Any tips and tricks you can share for the listeners on you know, how do they go about navigating this challenge as well? Sure. So we work very closely with our accounting team and they have been very, very proactive in supporting us in this area. You know, like you said, when you look at cloud or a lot of these uh, innovative technologies, it's all for, for utility O&M based, which, which poses a constraint because we're continuously being asked to reduce our O&M. Um, but we've been fortunate that we're able to capitalize cloud in two different scenarios. So the first is through the deployment phase, right? So whether it takes um, six months or a year, we're able to, do, to capitalize the deployment of the application. So for example, we're migrating a lot, a lot of our applications to the Oracle Cloud. We're a big Oracle uh, shop for you know, finance supply chain uh, systems like that. And so let's say those deployments take a year or two, we can capitalize that component. When you're getting into the agile world, um, obviously you're not as fortunate because you're deploying in, in weeks and months versus years. So we're still kind of working some of through some of the agile methodologies and how we can capitalize more in that space. Um, we're also able to capitalize if you're able to bring or install the software on premise. Um, so for example, uh, we recently upgraded to the Microsoft E5 uh, suite, or, um, the suite of services and products. And we were able to capitalize almost 60% of those products because we literally went through uh, service by service or product by product and identified which ones we could install on premise if we actually wanted to. So, um, so those are two ways that we've kind of um, been able to move the needle a little bit, but it, it continues to be a challenge, um, especially again, because we, we need to do, use things like cloud to, to do POCs and, and, and quickly innovate. Um, I also recently attended a public service commission webinar, uh, the, the New York State Public Service Commission uh, webinar um, on this topic. So I think, it's just good that we're all talking about it and hopefully we'll make some space from a regulatory, we'll make some movement uh, in this space from a regulatory perspective. So, so at least there's hope in that, in that space. Perfect. Scott, is there anything you can throw in from the Microsoft side and the work that you're doing to try and kind of help the cause? Um, you know, when you talk about some of the discussions that Allison just mentioned, obviously I know Microsoft's been making significant investments also in trying to, you know, basically prove out the point that you can be NERC for compliant and kind of aid the cause? Yeah, so that's there's then that's two distinct areas that we're kind of leaning in on. So we've been working very closely with FERC in helping them understand how you know cloud infrastructure should certainly be considered for bulk energy system workloads, right? And I think we've made a lot of progress there. And so I won't elaborate too much, but I suspect it's more of a matter of when, not if. I think that there is certainly going to be uh, whether it be by using some of our FedRAMP blueprints or GovCloud versions, or actually just changing the overall overall posture in regards to cloud when it comes to audits and assessments and things like that. So I think we're going to get there. On the capital bias side, that's an area that we're leaning in as well. And I think it comes down to education and supports at this point in time, at least on a rate case by rate case basis. But what we want to actually contribute to the conversation is to talk about where I started with my presentation today, where I talked about how we have strategic services that are available in the cloud and that the scale and the performance that are available by leveraging coordinated data centers 
will allow you to do things that you just cannot accomplish by way of just using a traditional data center approach. And so what we're trying to do is really have a conversation around the strategic value around cloud. And I think tying that to energy transition, tying that to you know policy mandates around renewables and showing that there is gonna be this need for decision level support by leveraging the scale of cloud is where I think we're gonna be able to you know, lean in and have impact. I think that you know, with uh, perhaps you know the change in administration, I think that there's going to be a real push, you know, for a lot of the the you know grid modernization technologies that are going to be required to support kind of a renewable future as well. And so we think that there may be some influence there. All right, wonderful. Well, um, I'm going to keep everybody honest on our time. I think we got about a minute left. So if there's any closing remarks anybody wants to make, um, feel free. Otherwise, I just want to thank everyone for your time today and for your contribution. Um, this was a great debate. I wish we had our debate. I should say dialogue. Um, I wish we had a little bit more time. I'm sure there's a couple more topics we could have dug into, but um, I want to give you some time back in your day. Thank you all. Stay healthy, stay safe, and have a fantastic holiday.